Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you're listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. Today we have with us in studio multi-instrumentalist and arranger Luke Sullivan. This guy plays just about any instrument that he puts his hands on, so he's one of those guys. You can learn a ton from him. We talk about the changes in the music business. He's been in the music business for 16 years now. And it's changed a lot since 2000. So he takes us through some of what those changes are and what you have to do as a modern musician to adapt. This guy's been on tour with artists like Mandisa, Toby Mac, and Jeremy Camp, just to name a few. So if you're wanting to become a pro musician, this is an interview that you don't want to miss. But before we jump into the interview, I wanted to make you aware... We've launched our Music Production Mastery course. Music Production Mastery takes you through A to Z in music producing. Things like vocal production, drum production, bass production, guitar production, editing, mixing and mastering, the DAWs like Logic and Pro Tools, as well as some other tips that you need to know. If you're interested in that, text the following. Text PRODUCE to 44222. That's PRODUCE. P-R-O-D-U-C-E to 44222. And we will send you a free copy of our top 10 tips for successful music production, as well as sending you the info that you need to sign up for that course. Without any further ado, here's Luke Sullivan. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, man. Just got off the road with Jeremy Camp, is that right? Indeed, yeah, I was filling in for, uh, sorry, I kicked the mic there. Oh, you're good, man. Filling in for my buddy, Toby Friesen, yeah. and who's an awesome guy. Jeremy and his whole camp are just phenomenal. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> so we met a few years back in the mountains of Washington. You were playing on a session, kind of a completely live thing, and the first thing I kind of noticed about you was you had brought all these different instruments and you had like a lap steel and you're like, hey, we'll do a mando on this other song. And I think one song you did electric and one song you did banjo. And yeah, just yeah, that's right. playing, is there an instrument that you don't play, I guess, is <laughs> the question. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a bunch of them that I don't play, you know, virtuosically. Yeah. But if it's got strings, I generally try to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Violins the whole bow thing you know i play upright bass but the whole bowing thing was never yeah you know it just it didn't stick it's a different animal so yeah (laughs) those guys are like untouchable i had buddies who played in the symphony and stuff so it was like i'm not even gonna pretend you know to right wield the horse hair yeah it's like they'll spend (laughs) a lifetime on it (laughs) absolutely they do yeah yeah so there's no way that people who just play guitar can walk in and expect it's almost like yeah this is sort of an insult to bass players, but it, it's like every guitar player can kind of play, you know, dumb guy bass. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, with the pick and everything. Yeah. yeah. But it's yeah. not the other way around. So yeah. how did you first get into music? What was your first exposure to it? Well, I'm sure you run into this a lot. You know, you have everybody's got this kind of strange winding road from when it starts, you know. And I think for me, my parents were basically hippies. So I was around good music from a very early age because they were just into it you know they were thankfully they were into positive stuff or whatever so there wasn't any kind of goofiness surrounding it but there was good music and you know my dad had sung as a teenager in a band you know in Detroit he's from Detroit and my uncle played bass in a Christian band ironically he was out of Detroit as well and they did some touring with like I think it was Petra maybe and some of the other Christian rock bands from back in the late 70s, early 80s. And he actually ended up giving me his 75 P bass later on after I'd been playing professionally for a while, which is kind of cool to have that around. And so it kind of started with me, like, in terms of, like, playing an instrument, I remember going down to my uncle's basement and looking at the, you know, he had some strats and he had basses and he even had the old, like, MXR flanger and EQ pedals and stuff. And so... You know, being probably whatever, I don't know how old I was, six and eight years old, somewhere in there. And and also, I was in Detroit for a short time where our family lived there. And so I think the whole Motown kind of vibe got under my skin a little bit in a good way. Yeah. So, you know, and then later on, my dad was a pastor, and so we were involved 
in a uh, church that was kind of part of the vineyard movement, which mm. had a lot of kind of this explosion of music happening. A lot of it out of California, some of the guys from Canada. We lived in Missouri, but we were kind of like this middle point where a lot of gatherings would happen and stuff for that church affiliation. You know, I was I was really fortunate to be around that because it was kind of a safe place to learn music, and I was around players that were good and they could improvise and all that kind of stuff. And I really didn't pick up the guitar until I was probably about 14. But I had played piano from an early age. Gave up on lessons, but <laughs> or my parents gave up on me taking lessons. But I uh, was always fascinated with the piano because it's all right in front of your face. Yeah. Kind of experiment and the whole idea of picking out a melody that you maybe heard. Yeah. And just that experience of like, wow, I can create, you know, yeah. that whole thing. So. So no lessons, you kind of just jumped into it, just self-taught? Definitely. Things kind of changed later in that regard. But yeah, I mean, I was probably, I think I was 17 when I started kind of like getting paid to gig and stuff like that on guitar. That's pretty good. That's yeah. Pretty good start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, I was fortunate, you know, to be around people who believed in me. Yeah. Um, man. I feel like I didn't even own a tuner until I was 17. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, they really believed in me. <laughs> For me, just as a, as a Christian and following Jesus, you know, I was really, uh, that has a lot to do with me sitting here, you know. Yeah. A lot of stuff I couldn't predict, you know, kind of happened along the way. Yeah. But that's kind of the early story, you know. Yeah. If you can even remember this, what was your first concert experience? So definitely, let's see, I think my first actual concert was Carmen. <laughs> he used to do, like, free concerts. Yeah. So this would have been probably sometime in the 80s. I'm in my mid-30s now, so, golly, I don't even know when that would have been. But, yeah, that was probably my first concert. And, and at that time, I feel like they had maybe video or they had some production elements going. And so that was pretty cool as a young person to see that. When I hit my teens, I probably, a lot of things changed. I was in high school when the grunge thing hit with Nirvana and Pearl Jam mm -hmm. and everybody. So that was kind of, I, I remember a handful of shows. We used to have a thing called Day at the Hill out of Kansas University in Lawrence, Kansas. Mm. They would bring in a ton of bands. And so it was, I remember seeing like Matthew Sweet and a bunch of these kind of underground heroes, basically, of alt-rock. It was kind of a big soup but the cool thing about back then was that there was a lot of killer songwriting, I think, that was going on. Actually, there's so many bands, it's hard to even point out one. But there was a real kind of raw thing happening. And I remember when I'd be at those shows, I didn't go out a whole lot, but when I'd be at those shows, I was always impressed or it left a good taste in my mouth in, in terms of, man, rock and roll's still alive, you know? Sure. <laughs> there, there's guys still writing real songs about real whatever. Yeah. There's still people moshing you know, and yeah. <laughs> crowd surfing or whatever, <laughs> you know. So you've kind of been in the industry, quote unquote, since about 2000. Was that kind of your first yeah, foray? I would, yeah, I would say like in terms of making a living for music and, and kind of making a concerted effort to yeah do that for a living. Yeah. So in the past 16 years since you've been in it, I'm sure there's been a lot of changes in the music business. Yeah. How has that affected what you do? If any. Yeah, sure. I think that's a big, kind of a long answer, you know, so it's... We got time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate, even at an earlier age, before I was a professional musician, quote unquote, to uh, start recording on tape. And my first studio experience, I was probably about 10 years old, and I came in to sing gang vocals on something. Mm. And coming up in Kansas City, there was a couple producers there and a couple engineers that were just absolutely stellar. And, and I think a lot of cities had more of that maybe than there is now. Now you have, you know, obviously Pro Tools rigs everywhere and that kind of thing. But the real guys who had the art of recording down, it was harder back then to have that skill set, in my sure. opinion. You know, it just took so much more gear you know, all that kind of stuff. So I was really lucky that I got to work with some people like that at an early age. So even before I was working as a musician, I was able to work in the studio on tape. And so the first big change, obviously, was when digital came in. 
And I remember doing a live record. It was a live worship record when I was like 19 years old. And it was on the first Pro Tools kind of interface that they came out with. Wow. And they had gone out and bought, I think it was like four or eight channel interfaces. Yeah. So everything went surprisingly flawlessly. And I remember getting to be a part of the editing process afterwards and just kind of being fascinated by using a mouse to do fades or whatever, you know, and all that kind of, that thing was just like, wow, this is, you know, obviously fun. Yeah. (laughs) So the first thing to answer your question would be, I think the sound changed, Mm. you know. I mean, hearing tape in a real studio from an early age, I think there was a difference in sound to me that I noticed even early on when things went digital. I think a lot of the engineers obviously their goal was to not let it sound different, you know, but it was just the nature of ones and zeros, yeah. you know, yeah. digital stuff. And, you know, secondly, in terms of as a musician, I think things became a little bit more maybe scientific just in general, a little more surgical. I mean, I'm sure the great musicians from the 70s and stuff would probably say the same thing. You know, it's mm. the studio process is kind of scientific, but... I think once you can see waveforms, once you can get in there and really dissect at that level, it just gets a little more, you know, or a little less artistic in a way. But, um, sure, you know, I think we all made our peace with it, you know. How do you mean by that in a tangible example? Now you're going to make me back it up here. Let me think. <laughs> yeah. Back up what I said. Well, I think the way that it has helped the artistic process is being able to do another take quickly and to be able to punch in easier, those sorts of things. That actually helps the artistic process, in my opinion. Sure. Maybe the way that it can get in the way sometimes is either option paralysis, you know, um, we can do a million takes, Mm. or we can take that chorus and that verse or whatever it is. And so maybe it can get in the way of trying as a team to get into the zone together, you know, um, sure. try to get the perfect take, you know, maybe it's, it's less pressure to get the perfect take, that kind of thing. Yep. And so maybe sometimes it can lead to, you know, I don't have to try my best or something, you know, but I, I think most people who are in it try their best anyway, but it's, you know, right. it's just knowing the tools are there to cut out things or whatever it is. Mm. I think it could potentially get in the way of capturing great moments, but yeah, there's, Probably a better answer, but that's what I have right now. No, Sorry. that's 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 really interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, a lot of the people we've had discussions with, you know, when I ask about how has the music business changed in the past 20 years, it's, well, you know, we've got to do this or more, the, like going the, the business side of it. Sure, yeah. But that was really interesting to hear, yeah, you know, more is not always better. The fact that we have 100 and whatever it is, 28 tracks yeah. and Pro Tools. yeah. Is not always a good thing, because then you can just wind up adding stuff until you feel like it. You can't fit anything else in there. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I really do think that's a huge struggle these days. You know, because it kind of start. You start thinking those philosophical questions. You know, like lately, I've been wondering. Okay, is the function of music in our culture just completely different now? Mm. So. If you look at, like, for instance, worship music to me is sort of a functional type of music. It serves a purpose. Yeah, It's a lot more clear Mm -hmm. in that particular arena, kind of what you're going for or, you know, what the purpose is. Then you have everything else, right? And I think it's that everything else type of music that I'm actually involved in a lot. And then you look at YouTube and you see the consumption of music process has changed. So to me, I start thinking things like, I think music, what it's for, quote unquote, in people's minds may have truly changed from when I was a kid, you know, which when I was a kid, there were still artists who they were trying to say certain things in their music to impact culture, Mm -hmm. you know. There are still artists doing that now, but it seemed like it was more the norm back then that songwriters would really try to you know, even say things politically or whatever it was to create some sort of impact in the culture, you know? Yeah. And now I think with YouTube, I was having a conversation with a friend about this who's been in the industry a lot longer than I have, and 
his theory was kind of about the commoditization of music. So you have a lot of cross-marketing that happens when people release records. You know, a lot of the top artists are really good at doing this, you know, where there'll be kind of <laughs> different products being introduced alongside like the music. Like features. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And some of that is actually propping up you know, the music industry. And those relationships sometimes create another obstacle to the artistic process, you know, because mm-hmm. then you got to look at, do we have to prop up the release of the CD with extra monetary attachments, Yeah, you know, yeah. in terms of marketing? And so that to me, I mean, first of all, obviously things have drastically changed at the consumer level of music, you know, yeah. I mean... When we were growing up, it was however many dollars to buy a CD. Yep. Napster came along, kind of did the whole cut the legs out from the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Music's free, you know, and then this rebuilding process started to happen, and it never really got back up to when I was a kid, you know, when people were paying pretty good money to buy music, you yeah. know. And even, I mean, their stereo systems were insane. You right. know, people were <laughs> right. buying these crazy stereo systems. So, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, the business side has changed so drastically that I actually kind of feel like the purpose of music has maybe changed in our Mm. culture to the point where you can just go on YouTube and it has become, to me, maybe the potential is there for music to truly just become white noise. Mm. And I think guys like me or you or whoever who's been around for a while yeah. we start to get a little down when we talk mm. about it because it's like, <laughs> mm. what's happening? You know, like, sure, it feels sad, yeah. you know, whether or not this is the end of the story. I don't think it is, you know, yeah. but yeah. but it definitely makes you think, you know, yeah. so. No, that's good. I don't think we've had that conversation that the purpose of music for the listener has changed. I'd love to shift gears for a yeah. minute and talk about a lot of your work has been on the live side versus yeah, doing the studio. For sure. Has that been kind of by choice, or what would make a musician want to be a live musician versus yeah. a studio session guy? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I think hopefully, I would assume most of your listeners who are musicians, the live thing may be their only outlet right now. And that's definitely how I started. And if you are considering going in the studio or you know, interested in recording, hopefully you never lose that passion, you know, for live music because there's just something that happens at concerts and, Mm. you know, that is really, really difficult to replicate in the studio, you know. Yeah. For me, I actually really didn't tour. I did some touring when I was younger, probably 22, 23 years old, did a couple tours, and that was great in terms of just building relationships, you know, and some of those people I've seen 10 years down the road, you know, uh, here in Nashville. And man, remember when we were kids and touring or whatever. And then I took a big break from touring about probably six years ago, started touring quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. I've done most of my touring here in Nashville has been with an artist named Mandisa, who was on American Idol and got signed to Capitol at the time. I think it was yeah. EMI. Yeah. I've been with them for a long time. Yeah. And, man, she's just such a gem. And that chemistry that we've had in that particular touring group, most of the guys are studio cats kind of by nature or by trade. So it's a little bit of a different vibe maybe than, you know, a band that's touring. or you know, They started out touring in a van and 200 dates a year, sure. 250 or something. So for her, it's been a really professional environment, which is cool, but also we have had a lot of chemistry, which is makes it feel like a band, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, that's only made me better, just as a person, as a musician. I only have good things to say about that experience for me. And the great thing about playing live is you want to do your best. I mean, pretty much any... You take the most anarchy type music, punk music. Yeah. They're still trying to do their best on yeah. stage, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I think that's great for any musician to go and, and try to just give 100%. There's so much to be gained from being yeah. on the road. So much that you learn about your instrument or instruments, if you're doing more than one, or gear. 
man, there's just so many things you have to troubleshoot when you're on like a real tour, you know. Mm-hmm. You get into the first week and realize this isn't working or, man, yeah. I got to go get a wireless thing or whatever yeah. it is that you got to do to make the show work, you know. Mm-hmm. There's so much uh, good that comes from that. Well, it's interesting because it's a different skill set. You, you yeah. talked a little bit about in the studio now how in the back of your mind you know there's tools that, hey, if I mess up here, yeah, they can easily uh, take that part of that take and uh, that chorus was good, so use yeah. that piece. Yeah. Live, you kind of just get one go at it. <laughs> yeah, I think if you're looking at going into the studio, yeah, the live thing is crucial because you also want to know I think most great producers try to give the artist something that can be translated live in terms of a product. Um, I think that maybe sometimes that doesn't happen, but in my experience, producers are generally pretty sympathetic to the fact that that artist, to make money, is going to hit the road. So then it becomes a little bit tricky because these days there's so much programming that goes on in the studio, so it's kind of that question of, how do we replicate this live, you know? Yeah. And and musicians, honestly, today really do have to, if you're a live musician, it is going to be very helpful for you to understand the production process, how to play alongside of tracks. Click track is king in the studio and also live now, yeah. you know? So it used to be when you were learning an instrument, your instructor would always say, you got to play with the metronome. You got to play with the metronome. Right. <laughs> and now it's like, yeah, you definitely have to know how to do that. Yeah. Not just for your own good. You know, yeah. you just straight up need to know how to do that. Right. You know? So, yeah. Even if it's just eighth notes that you're playing. Yeah. Talk about when you got your start from Kansas City, right? That's, yeah. That's where you're from. Yep. So you kind of got into it. Was it even in a jazz background? Did you mm-hmm. start playing in jazz clubs and doing that circuit yeah when i was coming out of playing in church dabbling in the studio in different situations and just getting my feet wet with music in general and then getting serious about it i started teaching guitar lessons and when i did that i think i figured out i have no clue how to tell people how to play guitar so uh (laughs) that was kind of a interesting moment but really what it led me to do was study and really, a lot of the guys that I learned from were piano players, yeah. and that kind of led me into the jazz world. In Kansas City, there's, at that time, I actually don't know how it is right now, but um, at that time, there's still like a kind of a rich heritage there with jazz. Count Basie and Charlie Parker and a bunch of like jazz heroes hmm. used to spend a lot of time, some of them were from Kansas City, but they used to spend a lot of time there because it was just kind of this cross you know, it's right in the middle of the country, so a lot of artists would come through there. It was just a good little kind of hotbed, you yeah. know. And there's actually a jazz museum there, um, so there's a wow. whole history there that if anybody's there, they can go check out. But yeah, so I was again, I was like super fortunate when I started gigging, trying to actually make a living. I'd be like teaching some lessons. I was playing a lot of bass in the studio during the day for local producers, whether it was like jingles or indie records that were actually really cool. Like, you know, at that time, it was kind of like that Sufjan Stevens kind of thing was starting to Mm. barely creep up into, it was from folk into something else, you know, that was a little more, you know, you had electronic elements mixed in with folk stuff. And Mm. so I was playing bass and guitar a lot in the studio during the day, and then at night I would go play jazz gigs, and that was really my education. My, Ironically, my wife is... She was at conservatory. She's a classically trained piano player. Wow. And her degree was music theory. So I was getting schooled in jazz theory by these guys. I was actually playing alongside like professors at the school where she was Hmm. studying. Wow. (laughs) And so I would just kind of like by osmosis glean, assimilate what these guys were saying or even just the biggest thing I learned from like being a jazz musician, which was about four or five years of pretty intense gigging was just listening. Mm. You know, that's the beauty of that whole world. I think that there's probably a lot of things that would probably deter somebody from even like sticking their foot in the water or toe in the water with jazz. Um, 
just the name itself, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's not really relevant anymore. It's like, you know, jazz. Right. But uh, it's kind of become a joke, you know. But sure. unfortunately, I mean, this was an American art form, you know, and yeah. blues along with it, which was real strong in Kansas City where I grew up too. It actually led me into like playing with a lot of hip hop folks and, you know, when Miseducation of Lauren Hill came out, when that record came out, a lot of things changed, I think, for anybody who was quote unquote soulful or had some soul, you know. Yeah. I think a lot of in the late nineties, man, a lot of stuff happened really in music that I think influenced where we are now. But for me, the jazz thing was really was my education. And I actually ended up my days were weird, man. I would like like I said, I'd either be teaching lessons or doing studio sessions for local stuff. Then I would be gigging at night, and then I'd get home and I would study. I'd stay up. And my wife, I got married pretty early when I was like 22. So my wife, such a trooper, man, like marrying a musician. <laughs> uh, I wasn't particularly like ambitious, but I did, I just had a hunger. You know, it's like I would hear players doing stuff on gigs and stuff, and I would just get home and I'd be like, man, I got to know more, you know. So I just kind of had that hunger and drive to learn, which I think I ultimately get from my dad. My dad really gave me a, a love for just being a lifetime learner mm. and showed me the way there. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the jazz thing was cool, man, because it, it really taught me how to apply sound musical concepts to a lot of different situations, you know, yeah. so it didn't just have to be funky music. It didn't just have to be, you know, quote unquote swinging because I would take what I did at the jazz at night playing jazz gigs and I would bring it into the studio the next day and figure out a way to apply it, you yeah. know, so even if it was a singer songwriter doing some kind of really folky thing. I would still find a way to apply what I was learning, you know. Yeah. And so that was really a beautiful time for me. I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. That was kind of my next question was, I mean, in my mind, I know so little about that scene and about sure. jazz music. I mean, my musical theory knowledge is so limited. Are you able to take what you learned in that time and use it today when you're doing a session for... Yeah you know, Mandisa or yeah. whoever you mentioned, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's no way I would have even been able to tackle the number system that we use here in Nashville. I guess I would have figured it out one way or another, but mm -hmm. one of the ways, like one quick example of trying to think how to phrase this, mm -hmm. it's been a while since I taught. <laughs> so yeah. my teaching chops are a little scarce right now but <laughs> yeah you know like one thing that helped me in my transition to moving to Nashville was understanding how to add interest to simple arrangements you mm -hmm. know my mind the way that I work I'm an arranger in kind of by nature sometimes that works to my detriment sometimes it works out great can you talk about just for no listener left behind what does an arranger do that's a good question yeah do they do anything anymore <laughs> Well, that's just it's a, term that, it's a term that you don't hear. So I, when you say yeah. that you're more of an arranger, what does that mean? Now I'm starting to feel old, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, like way back, even on recording sessions, you would have like an arranger, a copyist, you know, who would write down what the arranger was arranging and make it legible for the musicians in standard notation. And so the arranger, you know, there's a lot of legendary ones that you can look up. A guy named Arif Marden is one of them, and he worked with the best of the best in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and he actually, I think he produced and arranged Nora Jones' first wow. record. Yeah. So look that guy up. He's from Turkey originally. He's passed away now, but there's a documentary on him that's really cool. Yeah. So to me, guys like him would be probably the quintessential example of an arranger, you know, somebody who basically came in, added... For him, it would, would have been orchestral elements into the pop setting, basically filling out the space around the live band. So drums, bass, keyboards, guitars, lead singer. He would come in and fill in the gaps, you know, so whether it was a French horn section, whether it was a string section, you know, and, and, and he would also probably 
delineate or put that in the sheet music itself. You know, this needs to be a small ensemble. This needs to be uh, chamber orchestra, whatever it is. A lot of these guys were much more trained than I am. <laughs> My mind works like that, sure. but these guys had, you know, they had the uh, pedigree or whatever. Yeah. Uh, interesting thing about Arif actually is Quincy Jones kind of discovered him. Wow. Um, really cool story, but Quincy Jones is another great example. You know, if you listen to those Michael Jackson records, you know, at least at least these days, everybody still agrees that Michael Jackson records are still pretty boss. Yeah. To use another dated term. <laughs> uh, but uh, kids, uh, I don't know what you'd say now. But, I, don't uh, think they, I don't know if they say boss. <laughs> I don't know what tight. the kids say these days. <laughs> they don't even say tight, man. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, but Quincy Jones, man, if you, if you listen to Michael Jackson, Quincy Jones is probably the reason you listen. You don't even realize it, but, mm. you know, he's wow. a crazy arranger. You know, when you listen to the horn parts, when you listen to how they would basically carve out space in the music, you know, it's like the kick drum had its own spot, the snare had its own spot. I mean, a lot of it was the engineer as well on those records, but Quincy was kind of the mastermind producer, arranger, all that. Michael Jackson was also an arranger. I mean, his sure. vocal parts are insane, you know. But Quincy was a jazz cat that basically, you know, left the gigging jazz world as a trumpet player and went into producing and arranging and had the demeanor or whatever to do that. So, Kind of thinking about the big picture. When you go into a studio session or a live session, you're kind of thinking in terms of, the big picture and and where does this fit where's the space for what yeah. i'm doing versus that's always yeah that's always been my mode of operation and sometimes i get myself in a corner doing that because sometimes you can overthink hmm. you know what you're doing like as a guitar player a lot of times it's bread and butter stuff you know you need to play eighth notes you need to play power chords you need to play you know big a whole note or what we call on nashville diamonds throughout a different passes you're layering different parts together a lot of the work that i've gotten in the last probably five or six years people will send tracks to me at home and that's where that arranger piece kind of comes in handy is i can kind of like layer parts together and so that that mindset has helped me be able to deliver a product to people even if we're not sitting in the same room together sure. you know so yeah it, it has come in handy at different times for sure so you're that's an interesting point that I don't think we've touched on a lot that I think a lot of people outside of Nashville maybe think that the typical day for a producer or for a musician is that you come into a studio and you've got this band set up and it's all mic'd up and you hit record. But a lot of it nowadays, you said people are just sending you tracks. Right. And how does that work? Are they kind of just like, <laughs> come up with ideas or we want it to sound like right. this? Or yeah. what does that even look like? It probably looks different for different people. I guess maybe through the relationships that I've built through the years, you just have a certain level of trust with those people, and maybe they tell somebody else, hey, this, you know, Luke is going to be great for your project. Just send him the stuff, kind of give him a reference or whatever. A lot of times I'll ask for a reference if somebody's, especially if I don't know them or whatnot, I'll kind of ask for an overall reference point for what they're doing. We were talking about Michael Jackson a minute ago. So, you know, if somebody gives me a pop track and, you know, they want kind of those funky, clean guitars like a Michael Jackson thing or something, I'll, mm. I'll ask for a reference point. Yeah. These days, people would probably call it like Uptown Funk, you know. Right. The, the right. Uptown Funk guitar. Right. Um, but uh, so those things kind of change over time, you know, and, and that's actually a big part of being a studio musician is kind of staying up on music in general so that you're not lost when somebody says Adele or mm -hmm. something more obscure, you know, Illumineers or something, you yeah. know. I would sound cooler if I could come up with some of the names right now of no, no, the it's... hipster stuff. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I do try to stay up on stuff. And, and I the thing that's great for me is I love listening to music, period, so... I love the stuff that's coming out now and, you know, want to be an active part of the music scene. And so I really try to listen to a lot of stuff. And in terms of like when people send me tracks to work on, most of the time, you know, you've got drums and bass hopefully already recorded or 
sometimes they're actually in the virtual capacity. So somebody has gone in and at the very least put a drum loop through the song, maybe even some producers will play key bass on, you know, mm -hmm. the keyboard and at least have kind of like a mock-up of the song. You know, the easiest sessions are the ones where the pre-production basically spells out where the song is going, mm. and I don't have to overthink too much. Working at home, I will say one cool thing about that is that you take chances that you probably wouldn't in a room. Your imagination goes a little further, I think, maybe if you're gifted in that particular. Some people, you know, working alone is not their thing. You know, I'm an introvert by nature, so it's like, it works for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, my imagination starts to go, and there's a lot of producers who are like that. I mean, there's producers that I don't even know if they've been out of their room for the last 15 <laughs> years, you know? <laughs> They're like, it's like, man, have you, you need some sunlight. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> so in a lot of ways, I think a lot of music is made by you know, introvert types, but in terms of like tracking guitar or bass or mandolin, banjo, pedal steel, a lot of the things that I've done, for me, I end up, you kind of have to start making decisions like, okay, am I going to go for like one guitar part on this song that's really stellar and can really, really, truly stand on its own? Or do I start doing the kind of layering, arranging mm -hmm. thing where you have multiple parts that are running together? And you still want those multiple parts to be able to stand on their own, you know. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times what happens is when it gets back to a producer, they'll kind of chop up bits and pieces. And then there's a secondary part to that where I had to learn how to become an engineer sure. in my own right, which is I've been doing more mixing lately on some projects, and so mm -hmm. that's kind of come in handy. But I never thought I would. That kind of goes back to your question of how has the music industry changed? Well, I became an engineer. Right. Um, but uh, you kind of just learn. Well, it's back to your lifelong learner thing. Yeah, I mean, you never, never right. stop learning. Yeah, yeah. It's like much to my wife's chagrin. Like you've been in the studio for fifteen hours. You know. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> my family's so awesome. You know, it's like all of us that do this for a living will tell you at some point. You know how uh, you need a supportive family. Yeah. You know. Because it's really, I mean, it's it's a work of passion, you know. I mean, you got to have passion to to stay in it, and so I don't know. Maybe I kind of went too far on answering your question there, but no, that's that's great. That's great. Do you think it's harder now than when you got in at two thousand? Yeah, I mean, I think the economics have changed so much that the quick answer is yes. You know, I would just say, from my perspective, the budgets are lower for making records. A lot of that has to just boils down to technology and also how records are consumed. So if somebody, well, I don't want to go too far in answering your question, but yes, it's changed. It is harder, I think, to play one instrument, for example, and expect to make a living in the studio just mm. playing one instrument. You yeah. know, Tim Pierce, a guy out of L.A., great guitar player. I think he even has maybe his own podcast or something. He's, yeah. He does a lot of really cool. He's just a really neat guy. I've never met him, but mm. anyway, he, I remember him saying that at some point. From his perspective, somebody playing one instrument for a living is probably a thing of the past. I, mean, I, I think there's, wow. I think there are guys who have kind of like tenure maybe. So you have Abe Laboreal Jr. is a drummer in L.A. that I think of. It's like. He's been in it since he was really young. His dad was an amazing bass player, is an amazing bass player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's been playing drums since he was super young. And now he plays drums for Paul McCartney. So it's yeah. like, you know, you have people who have most definitely earned it, in my opinion, to just stick with an instrument. And maybe it's different in the orchestral symphonic world. To be quite honest, I mean... I would imagine that it's gotten harder for symphonic type instruments and just interest in general in symphonies yeah. uh, is probably a tough thing now, I would imagine. But man, we need violinists, you know, we need French horn players, you know, we need, mm -hmm. but I, I actually, 
just to kind of supplement the point, I had a friend who is a symphony French horn player back in Kansas City, and they had a great symphony. And he had played in like, I mean, he was in the Jerusalem Symphony at one point. I mean, this is like, he went to Juilliard. This is a very, very accomplished musician from my point of view and many other people's. And he had a side business. Hmm. You know, he had a artisanal waters and all these kind of, he had this business where he would sell really fine drinks or whatever. And he was kind of a real normal guy too, actually just, you know, love football. Like he wasn't like, you know, super snooty musician or whatever. But this was back, I mean, this was even 15 years ago, you know. So I think maybe the question is, I think it has been harder for musicians to maybe have, quote unquote, a normal life Mm -hmm. in terms of having a family. I think it's always been a little bit of a challenge for musicians in general. (laughs) to have a family life because we're always playing when everybody else is on vacation. Mm. We're the ones providing the entertainment, you know. But, you know, it's it's definitely something to keep in mind for young musicians. It may not be as cut and dry, you know, as other professions. Well, that's great, and that kind of segues into my last question was, you know, from your perspective, what's your biggest piece of advice you'd give to a young up-and-coming musician who's wanting to get in and maybe you just answered it (laughs) yeah right well no i i think man i mean if you love making music you're never going to be able to ignore that impulse you know Mm -hmm. so and the chances are that it's there in your system and in your soul for a reason you Mm -hmm. know and whether or not the economics or the ability to make money doing it is there, I think, here's my perspective. I believe that we're created in the image of God. God is a creator. Mm. Therefore, we are creative. And so to say, like, don't do it <laughs> right. would be a mistake on my part to a young person, you know? Mm. It's like, man, if you feel the urge to create, you need to do that, you know, and most likely that's going to lead to great, great things for you personally, whether or not it is commercially viable. That's kind of a whole nother issue, you know, Mm -hmm. and so, man, I mean, the deal is we need art in our culture, you know, and now having some years behind me, I can look back and say that, you know, in the digital age, it does feel like we've sped up our culture quite a bit. And I think that, you know, what art does is it slows it down. You know, when you sing a, you know, when you sing a note, it's slower than when you're talking, unless Mm. you're Busta Rhymes or something. (laughs) You know, I mean, that's dating myself right there. Busta Rhymes. Where'd that guy go? Uh, Wiz Khalifa. Anyway, (laughs) sorry. That's profound though, man. By creating art and by singing a note, you're slowing it down. That to me is the beauty, and that's why I got to be honest, man. Like for me, when I play guitar or whatever, things slow down for me. And mm. to be totally honest, it really helps me to truly cope with just the age we live in, you know. So this is something that maybe young people will be interested in. Is as I've continued to do music, I feel like the cost of doing it is actually greater in terms of commitment like Mm. staying committed to making art i feel (laughs) i feel like it's just become a greater commitment and i've had points where i felt like okay i can jump out of the game now or i can dig in you know and thus far i've continued to dig in and i never thought that it would be like that i never thought i'm gonna have to dig in harder and harder and harder as the years go by to do my craft Mm. you know it's I, i think i always had the kind of naive thought of like, I'll pay my dues, I'll work really hard, and then I'll just kind of (laughs) coast, which shows you how non-ambitious I was as a kid, but which I think probably worked out well for me and maybe shows you how slow I am to learning things. (laughs) Over time, I just started figuring out like, man, I got to dig in here, you know, like I got to, I got to really put some skin in the game. And even as I've had kids, I have three kids and I start to think about like, man, they're going to grow up like knowing their dad makes an artistic type of living, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And I had to kind of grapple with, do I want them to grow up in that reality, you know, of dads in there? Like now I'm working kind of on some TV and film things. And so, I mean, the other day I was like doing some sound design for a trailer and I was doing like, I had a bucket of water and I was getting uh, some sound samples of coins dropping in the water, stuff like that. Wow. Really crazy. Just, you know, if you walked into my house at that moment or my studio, you know, you'd kind of go, this is weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to hear that now. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it, it turned out surprisingly good. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's the reality that my kids are, you know, instead of dad is out back with the saw making a deck or whatever, I'm in my studio dropping coins into a water bucket, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of a decision that I've had to continue to, like, re-up, mm. you know, like, man, okay, I'm in this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do this. So, Well, that's good, yeah. man. Well, thank you so yeah. much for your time. This has been Luke Sullivan here on the Full Circle Music Show. Hi, this is Seth Mosley, and you've been listening to the Full Circle Music Show, the why of the music biz. This show is produced by the Full Circle Music Company with editing help from Jericho Scroggins and Kaylee Ingram. If you haven't already, text PRODUCE to 44222, and we'll send you a free copy of our top 10 tips for successful music production. Have a great day, and we will see you next week.